Much love and respect. Thanks for taking the time to watch another video. Appreciate all the support always. And I hope you find this information valuable. As I was saying yesterday in my last video, I want to definitely get through some of the books I have here in my Kindle library. And this is another one. We've already read the first two chapters of this book. Uh, this is uh, Mysteries of Ancient America. Uncovering the Forbidden by Fritz Zimmerman. And we're going to go to this part of the book where it's talking about the Wabansi Celtic monolith. This is a little image right here. I just want to add, remember, America is a true world. A lot of the times we may be seeing this in reverse. But also, yeah, if they came over here, they would just be returning, right? Who are the ancient Irish, the ancient Celtic people? What are their stories supposedly coming out of so-called Egypt, right? Canaan, Phoenicians... Fomorians, Danites, Israelites. Let's remember the previous videos. So it says here, Chicago Tribune, September 22nd, 1903. The Wabansi stone is certainly the largest, as it is one of the few authentic relics of Fort Dearborn. It is granite boulder, something more than six feet tall and three feet square and bears on one side of its top a rudely carved portrait of the Indian chief Wabansi, who in the earliest days of the frontier fort often showed himself a good friend of the white man, so-called white man. If you want to see the Wabansi stone, go over on the north side, walk up North State Street to Huron, turn to the east and go as far as Old Pine Street, now Old Lincoln Park Boulevard, then turn to the south and about three doors form the corner in the yard at the side of the house numbered 101 Lincoln Park Boulevard. You will see a fountain build up of big pieces of carved stone piled in a rough pyramid. In the center of this pyramid and projecting for some distance above it, the Wabansi stone, the same great boulder which lay inside the stockade when Fort Dearborn was built and from the top of which Daniel Webster, the godlike Daniel, predicted in 1837 the future greatness of the swampy village where she was then visiting for the first time. On one side of the great stone is plainly visible the carved likeness of Wabansi, the chieftain, if indeed it be his portrait. For some historians are inclined to the belief that the stone is much older than that. So real quick, here's another website on it. This is the mystery of the Wabansi stone of Chicago. You guys can know where we are. Chicago. One of the most fascinating and obscure artifacts in North America is tucked away in a Chicago museum, huh? It's tucked away. That's how big it is right there, comparison. The Wabansi stone with relics of the Chicago fire seen in 1911. The Wabansi stone has no real likeness to the chief, but striking resemblance to late Bronze Age Celtic monoliths and carved heads found in Ireland, all right? We don't even know if that's the chief himself. We got to believe somebody's drawn. But they're saying it looks like other things that are found in Ireland. Third photograph on the right is the Janus monolith. Janus. In fact, around the ancient and long neglected boulder has raged a historic controversy which divided local antiquarians into a number of opposing schools. 
As to the authenticity of the stone, there has never been a question. The difference is as to its origin and the use to which it was originally devoted. In the top of the Wabansi stone is a deep and rounded hollow. One school of historians holds to the belief that this hollow was originally made by the Indians and that it was used for years before the European came to raise a rude log fort as a mortar in which the patient Indian squaws using a another smaller stone as a pestle ground the maize or Indian corn into baking flour for baking of cakes. Both the Wabansi stone and the Janus monoliths have carved depressions on their top that were believed to have been used for boating offerings. Quite a coincidence. All right, just like the one in, in Ireland. When in 1812, Fort Dearborn was burned and its garrison practically wiped out by the savages, the Wabansi stone was left untouched. As it weighed something like 4,000 pounds, it is easy to see why the Indians did not disturb it. Through the years from 1812 to 1837, it seems to have been left to sink deeper and deeper into the soil outside the log fort. Certainly there is no historical happening during that period with which it is connected. But in 1837, the Wabansi stone was made to serve a new purpose. In that year, Daniel Webster, already a famous senator of the United States, has started to make a tour of the then almost unknown West. Daniel Webster, so say the historians, was accompanied on his triumphal journey by his son and daughter. He was taken into town, and one may take it for granted, properly wined and dined. Then later in that day, he was escorted to a platform made ready for his feet and lifted on top of the Wabansi stone, and from that perch he delivered a speech, the eloquence which still seems to dimly linger in the memories of first settlers and in which he prophesied the future greatness of the present metropolis. Again, for a number of years, the Wabansi stone seemed to have dropped, if not out of sight, at least into obscurity, but always the stern and rugged face carved on one side made it easy of identification, and there is no record that these years its position was changed. Finally, about the time of the war, Isaac N. Arnold, then congressman from Chicago, took possession of the ancient rock and had it moved from its old position to his residence on the north side, where it still remains. It stood in Arnold's yard when the great fire of 1871 swept the city, and Arnold's house went down in ruins with the rest. All right, you guys hear that? It survived the so-called Great Fire of Chicago. Future video about these great fires, huh? Shout out to the reset community. But the Wabansi stone safely came through the fire, suffering nothing more serious than a coating of smoke and dust. After the great fire, a collection of ruined cornices and carved capped stones themselves, now historic relics, was made, and they were piled about the Wabansi stone, which stood as it still does, in the center of the pyramid and projecting some little distance above the top. Also, a hole was bored through the old rock and pipes inserted, so that now it serves as a capstone of a rough fountain. Surely there are few if any such authentic and undisputed relics left to bind the Chicago of today to the Fort Dearborn of a century ago. Whether the carbon on his face be the work of some long-forgotten soldier in the frontier army of the United States, or whether the stone was cut by the mound builder of prehistoric times does not at all affect its value as a historic relic, which should be of interest to Chicago people, all right? In case you guys don't know about this Wabansi stone. The geographic importance of the location of the stone, all right, and here's a little map. The importance of the Chicago Portage is illustrated in this 1750 map showing the route from the Chicago River to the Des Plaines or Puans River, the Illinois River, and on the Mississippi River, and the location of the stone right here. So it was a major, uh, I guess, traffic spot. The stone is situated on the continental divide that separates the St. Lawrence watershed with the Gulf of Mexico watershed. For any people engaged in commerce, this is one of the most strategic locations in the American interior. The Chicago River leads to the portage that connects the Mississippi with the Great Lakes. The portage was first discovered in 1673 when French explorers Louis Joliet and Father Marquette were traveling upstream on the Mississippi River They were guided by Native Americans to the portage by entering the mouth of the Illinois River to the Des Plaines River and then traveling by land across Mott Lake to the Chicago River 
that flowed into Lake Michigan. When the famous French explorer, La Salle, surveyed the portage, he stated, this will be the gate of empire, the seat of commerce. All right, you guys hear that? Was the eight-foot stone erected as an ancient navigational marker or the work of an idle soldier at Fort Dearborn? We will never know for sure. Uh, it says here, megalithic America in search of the Celts. But remember, could we be seeing this in reverse? So this figure right here, right? It says, human figure carved on a rock face in West Virginia, appearing to be of Celtic origin. Photo by Jolie Molina. Near the Benz Run earthwork located on the Ohio River in Tyler County, West Virginia. Okay, then they got this uh, right here. Uh, check it out. It says here, Celtic looking stone carbon is located at Fern Creek Trail. Fern Creek Trail, all right? You see that? Wow. So that's in Fern Creek Trailhead near their new River Gorge in Fayette County, West Virginia. Let's hear Ogham script with an alignment to the winter solstice sunrise from March 1983, wonderful West Virginia, Wyoming, and Boone County petroglyphs. This brings me to the Celtic finds in around these same locations. The only possible theory is that the megalithic beaker people or Amorites experienced some cultural acclimation during their brief sojourn with the Celts. The inscriptions are Ogham, according to Barry Fell, who did the original work at this site. According to the West Virginia Cyclopedia, wonderful West Virginia authors go to the Wyoming Rock Shelter at dawn on December 22, 1982. Gallagher reports that the sun rose, a sunbeam funneled through a three-sided opening in the left side of the rock shelter and struck the sun symbol on the left side of the petroglyph. The rising sun soon bathed the entire panel in light. And again, the group continued to watch as the solar phenomenon demonstrated physical proof of Phil's decipherment. All right, check this out right here. Pile of rocks, which is a little monument they built, a beehive-shaped cairn located in West Virginia. A long history of cultural diffusion is evident in the hills and valleys of West Virginia. And we got like a little wall here. Much of the stone wall has been eradicated by mining operations on the hillside, but some vestiges of the wall remain intact. Remember, we found uh, all these walls in the forest and all these places in North America. The history of Fayette County, West Virginia, 1926, ancient stone walls of West Virginia. Near the summit of the mountain dividing the waters of Loop and Armstrong Creeks in Fayette County, West Virginia, there is found the remains of a very remarkable stone wall, which was well known by the first European settlers in the Kanawha Valley and to the Ohio Indians who passed along this route and hunting and other expeditions toward the Valley of Virginia, where, according to their legends, the buffalo migrated periodically from the Ohio Valley and further west. Stone towers along the stone wall marks the entrance to a cave. A recent visit by the writers of this history finds the wall but little, if any, change since the visit of Captain Page about 50 years ago. Two things, however, they did discover. One, a great stone in the center of the enclosure, which was probably the throne of the chieftain of the race or the sacrificial altar of the strange people whose beginning and end are lost in the midst of antiquity. The other disclosure was that the tower on the outside of the wall apparently covers the entrance to a cave. And the supposition is that the tower on the inside serves a like purpose. Were these people then cave dwellers? To what depth does the ancient passage way beneath the stones lead? All right, there's a cave under there. What would one find therein? These questions we leave for the more interpret to answer. All right, now remember uh, all those newspaper articles we read about all these ancient caves, these huge caves in uh, North America, and what they were finding in these places. Now imagine this one that has like a, a tower or chimney coming out of it. Like, wow. Says history and mystery of the Kanawha Valley, 1898. This wall for two miles or more faces the river on the front end of the mountain, which is very steep and difficult to ascend. Runs up the creek along the bench, thence through a low gap in the ridge to the corresponding bench on the other side of the ridge, facing the other creek, and back again to the river front in all some seven or eight miles in circuit of an irregularly elliptical shape with a cross wall dividing the enclosure into two. The wall was originally six to seven feet in height 
and nearly as wide as the base, but from its great age and partial disintegration of the stones, most of it has tumbled down, forming, as it were, a window of stones on the side of the original wall. Near the center of the enclosure are the remains of what are supposed to have been two round towers, probably 20 or more feet high, all right, towers, and 20 feet in diameter. These, like the walls, are now in ruins. It is difficult to even to conjecture the purpose and use of this curious work. And at such a place, there is within the enclosure one spring, a small but ever-flowing stream of water, all right, these springs. Along the riverfront of the base of the mountain is an extensive burial ground. The mode of burial was peculiar and entirely different from that of the Europeans, the Indians, or the mound builders. The bodies were deposited about four feet underground, horizontal from the hips down, and at an angle of about 30 degrees from the waist up, and all facing the east. This is a significant fact and points strongly to the idea that they may have been sun worshippers or descended from sun worshippers. That's the hijack. Why? Captain Page carefully examined a number of these skeletons, measuring the bones and facial angles of the skulls, and found that they conform much more nearly to the European race than to the Indian. I dodged the hijack. There was a pile of stones over each grave, because you can't tell complexion by bones. Mortared arch stone tomb contained eight giants in Burlington, Iowa. Arch stone tombs were found within burial mounds across Iowa. Many of these stone tombs contain the remains of giant humans. All right. The Grand River Times, Grand Haven, Michigan, May 21st, 1856. Western giants in their slumber. The Burlington, Iowa Gazette says that while workmen were engaged in excavating for the cellar of Governor Grimes, new building on the corner of Main and Valley Street. They came upon an arch vault some 10 feet square, which on being opened was found to contain eight human skeletons of gigantic proportions. The walls of the vault were about 14 inches thick, well laid up with cement or indestructible mortar. The vault is about six feet deep from the base to the arch. The skeletons are in good state of preservation, and we adventure to say are the largest human remains ever found being over eight feet long. Athens Messenger, April 21st, 1870. The mound had two circular arches of stone in it. One was about two and a half feet beneath the surface of the mound and another about six feet. Immediately under the first arch of stone was found two very large skeletons in a remarkable state of preservation. And under the second arch wall, other part of skeletons were found amidst ashes, coals, and mussel shells. It seems apparent that these who had been interred under the deeper arch had remained there many years before those under the upper arch were buried. Some of these skeletons were buried with their heads towards the center of the mound and some with their feet towards the center. All right, and this is a picture of a stone burial vault in Missouri. All right, this is what they're digging up in Missouri and they never talk about it. They always make it seem like nothing significant. They just be like, you know, nothing to see here. Clovis culture. Okay, move on. Yeah, right. Let's hear the Commonwealth of Missouri, a centennial history, 1877. In the February number of the Western Review of the present year, appears quite a lengthy article by Judge E.P. West containing an account of the examination of several mounds near the Missouri River which contained buried chambers or vaults built of stone, compactly and regularly laid. The stones which are undressed on the inside are laid horizontally and apparently have been selected with great care. The walls presenting, when the earth is removed, a smooth inner face. The chambers were generally of uniform size, being about eight and one half feet square and four feet in height. Each had an opening or doorway toward the south, two and a half feet in width, the walls were about 18 inches in width at the top and 5 feet at the base. Some are described as containing a large quantity of burnt human and animal bones, burnt clay, wood ashes, and charred wood, all intermingled and extended entirely over the floor, at one point to the depth of 8 inches. Judge West seems to favor the opinion that they were used for dwellings before the dead were interred in them. This was possibly the case 
but the commingled mass of burnt bones, charred wood, and burnt clay to the death of several inches would point to funeral rites by cremation. A house eight and a half feet square and four feet high would be a very confined habitation for a family of ordinary size. It seems more in consonance with the facts as stated to suppose them to have been furnaces for consuming the dead by burning. The judge computes their age to be about 2,000 years. Other and similar structures have been described to me and the localities of their site named by respectable persons who claim to have opened them of stone. One, I was told, contained a vault at least 150 feet in length, 50 feet wide and above 12 feet in height. Another much smaller was beautifully arched with stone. At the time the narrator saw it, it was cleared of the decayed skeletons and was used as a dairy house. The two just mentioned were in Missouri and distant from each other 150 miles. Again, the question recurs, who built them and whence their architectural skill and knowledge? All right, they don't know. That's where we're going to end it here today, guys. Again, I don't want to make these videos too long. It's actually a lot of topics in these books. He goes over. So we're going to continue trying to knock out these books and these topics because then we'll be able to use these uh, videos as reference. Like, remember that video we did about the Wabansi stone? Because it's all connected, all these videos. Once you have all this information out, you, you guys will be able to make your own conclusions about uh, ancient America. So I'm just trying to put out the information for now. But I am working on other videos as I'm doing this. The reason I'm doing these short videos too is because I'm working on longer videos during the day, which take more time. But I want to continue uploading something. So why not get through these little books right here, little by little. But more correlation, America's the truer world. This is what they're finding here. This is all the stuff they never told us about. When they wrote their Manifest Destiny, they said to not include this in official history. This is savage. Anything pre-Columbus. Thanks for tuning in once more, guys. Really appreciate you taking the time. Hope you enjoyed these little mini videos. Much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Wow.